G'day and uh, welcome back. This is part two of my Philips 206A radio restoration. In part one, I checked the radio. It needed a lot of work. Most of the wire had to be replaced. A lot of the caps were replaced. I created a few problems and fixed them and eventually the radio worked and we had a bit of fun gluing some valves back together. This week I'm gonna do the alignment, which is a little unusual to normal. And I'm gonna try something I haven't done before. If you wanna see part one, click on the link up the top of the screen here. So let's pick up part two with the alignment. Now for the alignment, there's the IF cans there, there's the adjusters, they're full of wax, so I'm going to have to break through there if I need to adjust it. The other day when I was troubleshooting, I noticed that the IF was set about 460. The IF, according to the book, is 473. I've got the radio on and I've got this generator connected and I'll run down and just see if it gets any better. There it is there. Yeah, so it's set at about 460 then. So I'm going to have to break the wax on these transformers. I'll do that and I'll come back and then we'll start setting it up. I've cleaned the wax out of these four slugs and just applied a little bit of heat and now I can turn them okay. Oh, what I didn't mention was the manual says to put a uh, 80 picofarad capacitor across the secondary while you adjust the primary and across the primary while you adjust the secondary. So I've installed that. That's on the primary of the first IF. I'll put some power on. Um, I've got everything set up. I've got my meter. I've got 473 on the uh, generator and I should be able to adjust this one here. Oops. I'll just adjust the meter. It's gone up to 50 volts now. There it is there. That's a very large adjustment. I'll turn that sound off. All right, let me swap this capacitor over to uh, the secondary. All right, I've repositioned my capacitor there. Uh, we'll see what we get now. Put the sound on for a second. All right, I'll adjust this. We'll see if we get a similar effect. Yeah, there it goes. That's it there. Okay. Let me reposition this again. Okay, uh, reposition that again. So I'll adjust this one this time. about there. Okay, I'll reposition the capacitor again. Uh, this should be the one I adjust now. I've repositioned my capacitor. Let's change the meter. Alright, so the IF's done. All I've got to do now is the RF stage. All right, the next stage is the RF. Now, this radio is pretty unusual. You don't need the scale on or the dial on the front to adjust the RF. All you do is use the wheel here. To set it up, you open the capacitor all the way and that's fully open. And then you measure 15 degrees of moving towards close. So I've made a little protractor up and I'm gonna glue it on there. I've just got a bit of double-sided tape in the center. That should hold it. Doesn't have to be that accurate. I've also put a little pointer on there, so we should be able to move this 15 degrees. There's 10, it's 15. All right. The adjustments are these two trimmers here. This one's the oscillator and this one's the antenna. I'll clean off this old wax that I got on here so I can get the little nut underneath. I've got power on the radio. That's still on 15 degrees. I've set the frequency generator to 1550. That's what they say to do. Now we should be able to bring it in with this trimmer here. I've got the speaker on, here it comes. All right, that's it. All right, now we trim it with the antenna trimmer here. Just go for maximum. That's about it there. That's it. That's all there is to the medium wave alignment. Uh, now the only other checks to do are long wave, and I'm not even sure there is one for short wave. But anyway, long wave is this one here. So I put it on long wave. I've got the generator set to 400 kilohertz. I put the speaker on. And it's there somewhere. There it is there. Right. Well, I'm not going to adjust that. 
all right, I'm not going to adjust that. It's one of those wire wound capacitors. Um, it's not worth it. Like we can't get long wave anyway. Uh, I'll find out what I have to do for short wave. I don't think there's an adjustment. That's it for the alignment. There's no short wave alignment. Some sets apparently had IF rejectors. It's not fitted to this set. As I said, the long wave, I'm not going to bother with it. It's, it's actually working pretty well, actually. This is the original output valve, and I've tried to fashion a repair on the top there. So I've um, JB welded a coil of wire with a bit of wire over the top, and I found the very end of the stub of wire there, uh, sanded away a bit or filed away a bit of the glass, and I've laid it on there and soldered it and glued that down. It actually works. So I'll just turn it on for a second like a German soldier, I would imagine. But there was a photo in the Brisbane Courier in 1939. So it works perfectly. Um, I wouldn't trust the repair because heating and cooling, it'll probably move away eventually, but I did manage to do it. So what I thought I might do is put a cap on it. I've got an old valve there. Glue the cap on the top of there. That'll stabilize the whole thing and uh, the valve should work. Here's the bottom of the valve. It did have one of those red shields down the bottom of this valve because it has got the um, detector in there. So I've put some foil around there and grounded it to the chassis. Uh, without that, there's, it whistles and uh, makes a lot of noise. That's a big problem with these Phillips valves with the built-in shield. Once that base comes loose, you've lost your shield. Uh, but the radio is working really well now. Um. Turn it into so all that whistling and howling's gone, and uh, yeah, it's working really well. I have a cap which I got off another broken valve, so I'm going to glue it on the top here. I mixed up a bit of JB Weld. I'll put it on the top of this. I just want to kind of glue this on as well. And the rest I'm going to put in the top of the cap. Right, that should be enough. I can put that in here, hopefully. There we go. So I'll let that set for a few hours and then I'll be able to solder the wire on the top. This adhesive has been drying for a while, so I'll just solder the wire in. And I'll just trim a little bit of wire off now. All right, so it's got a new cap on it. Somebody put tape around this valve previously. Uh, it's, of course, lost its connection between the base and the shield here. Uh, I'm going to take the base off again like I did with the other one and re-establish the connection to the shield. And it looks like I'll have to, there's not much shield left. So I'm going to try painting it perhaps with the silver paint and see if that works. But I'm not going to film it. I'll just do it and uh, we'll see how it comes out. Here's the repaired valve in. I'm going to test it. I've put the cap on. I changed that orange wire for yellow. It should be orange grid wire as standard orange, but Phillips had used yellow, so I'm going to stick with yellow. But it looks good. I don't know how long it's going to last. Um, I'm going to steel wool that red, but I'm going to give it a couple of days this time to really harden up before I do it. Also, this rectifier here, that was also loosened in the base. I tried gluing that without pulling it apart, and it was a complete failure. So I pulled it apart and uh, glued it back together. That's only got four wires in it. I reckon that took me... Oh, probably 20 minutes. That's all. It was very fast. This one took a little bit longer, but I probably did that in 35 minutes, I reckon. I'll show you a couple of improvements I did in the method that I used to do this one, uh, but I'll test it first. We'll see if it works before I brag about how easy it was. So, put some power on. Ooh, I should have gone to Tim Bowl, but it's okay. It's working all right. And it should have warmed up by now. I'll turn it up a bit. That's a grey area. Um, and a lot of the, the, the discussions that we're having with respect to alcohol, um, like people still think um, if... That's working as well as it ever has. I painted the um, whole bottom of this valve with my conductive silver paint and I want to see if it's going to be a shield or not. Now, before, if you put your hand anywhere near it, it used to whistle like mad. If you put your fingers around here, these used to whistle. I'll turn it up, we'll see what it does. 
clear from the students we, we consulted with. So, no, it would be much more engaging, real life, and provide the, the space to have... Nothing there. So that silver conductive paint has worked perfectly. Wow, so you learn something every day. Terrific. So I got that paint at the local electronics store. It's J Car if you're in Australia. And uh, that works great. Look at that. Fantastic. Great. All right. Now, the owner's managed to track down a new valve, so that's on its way. I won't be using this valve. It might be reliable enough. It might last 10 years, but it might last 10 minutes as well. Isn't that handy to know that you can rebuild the shield using that conductive silver paint? It's not that expensive. I think it was $13 for a little vial. And I've seen people wrapping tin foil around and it looks awful. That looks terrific. I'll show you the method improvements that I sort of came up with. This is an old tube. I'm just going to use this as an example. Um, the wire that I used, I cut longer than the last time and the other time was too short. I also fed it in from this way, uh, not back the other way, so that was easier. I left a bit of insulation on the end so I couldn't pull it through. Now releasing the solder in here, I added a bit of solder to each one. That seems to melt it much quicker, otherwise you can't seem to melt it. Uh, I marked pin number one on the body of the valve. I put a bit of masking tape on it so I didn't mark the valve. When I wired these wires onto the original bits of wire, I put a bit of flux on there and that helped tremendously. So put a bit of flux on there so they grip properly. And when I glued it, I put the glue on the glass. Uh, I did try putting it in the base, but it just got all over the wire. And of course the solder won't stick to the lug when you pull it through. Uh, the other thing I did was I didn't put any masking tape. I pushed it together, held it, and then wiped it off with a bit of acetone. And that made a much neater join. Now the other thing with the acetate was it took the red paint off and just left the gold shield underneath. So that saved me having to try and scrape off bits of red paint. Now of course after that it was just a matter of getting the ground wire around there, terminating it, and painting it all with that silver conductive paint. So I painted all the way up the valve to where I needed to go, let it dry, and then put the red paint over the top. Now, without pulling it apart, I've seen other people just wrap uh, wire around there so that it connects the, uh, the little earthing wire and the shield here. So they probably clean a bit of the shield off. Uh, I've seen other people run a wire all the way down here and clean a bit of the red paint off and, and kind of lasso it around here <laughs> and uh, make a little sling for it. So there's other ways of doing it. I tend to do it the way that it makes it look like it's the original valves. But anyway, it was all a bit of fun and quite interesting. Now, but the only other thing I've got to do is put the dial backing plate back on here, uh, restring the dial. There's a dial pointer to go on. We're getting a new dial glass, but I can use the old one to line up the stations. And that'll be about it for the chassis. All right, let's get onto that. Time to put the string on. I've already mounted this little frame here that's got some of the pulleys on it. I thought I had the dial string layout for this in the schematics, but it's not there. So I spent several hours constructing this drawing here that uh, clearly shows how it all works. So I'll use that as a guide. I've got a bit of string and I've tied a spring to the end. All right, I'll pull that around there and into the pulley. There we go. Around this pulley. And I'll put a bit of tape around there to hold that string on there. Uh, then I've got to wrap it around here twice and I hope I'm going in the right direction. I'll put two wraps around here. All right. And then around this pulley on the bottom. And then up the top. I can see this is going to be a problem, so I'll put a bit of tape around here somehow. Not sure if that's going to hold it. It might. And then it should go around this pulley here. And then onto the large pulley. I'll just tape the loose end of the... Uh, cord there for a second. Put a pretend pointer on here. There we are. Now here's the tuning shaft. If I turn that clockwise, I would expect that um, pointer to go down. Yeah, I knew it'd be backwards. <laughs> okay, I couldn't be bothered sitting there figuring it out. I had a 50 50 chance. I'll take the cord out, wind it the other way, and we'll come back and have a look. I've wound that in the other direction now. So clockwise, I think that should go down. Yeah, that's better. I put a lot of stretch into that spring and it's gotten way too much. I'll mark here where I want the cord to end up, but once I've run this through a few times, the spring will relax a bit. So I'm going to let everything go. I'll tie a knot here and we'll come back and hook it in. I've tied the knot in the string. I'll stretch this spring until I can get this on. Oops. There we go. 
Now I'll run it through a few times and that spring will collapse a little bit, but it looks pretty good tension wise anyway. Alright, that's finished working well. I'll trim off the excess bit of string here and I'll put a bit of uh, clear nail polish on the knots to make sure they don't come undone. That was a pretty easy one. Now something that did go wrong is when I was doing this knot up I noticed the string here it got dirty and uh, it had run off into the pulley there so I changed the string. Uh, I wasn't going to leave a bit of dirty string in there. The backing plate can go in now. I have the pointer here, I've painted it, I've put a new bit of felt on the back as well and that should just slip in there and just do the screw up on the clamp. Okay, that'll be good. Now that's got to be adjusted once the glass is on and I'll probably tune the station in and we'll adjust it then. I'll put the dial glass in, we have a new one coming so this is just temporary but it will allow me to set the pointer up. I'm going to align this pointer up using this glass. I'll probably have to do it again when we get the new glass. This is the medium wave scale. It's in meters. I have a little conversion chart here. It's uh, kilohertz to meters. Uh, now 526 meters is equal to about 570 kilohertz. So I've set the dial now at 525 meters and I've got the generator on 570 kilohertz. Now the radio is going. I'll turn it up. Nothing there. <laughs> So, I'll just tune it in. There it is there. So I'll move the scale up if I can through the glass. There's a little gap there. I'm not sure how you do this. Is this going to work? That looks close. It's um, jammed against the other side of the uh, scale here, so it's not straight. There you go. Yeah, it's too high. All right. So I'll tighten the screw up there. All right, that looks pretty close. I'll check it at the other end of the scale. If I put it on uh, 100, what be 200 meters, it should be equal to 1500 kilohertz. I'll put the generator on 15, and I'll run the uh, pointer down to 15 or 200. Uh, there's the 200 there. That's about there. I'll turn the volume up and see what happens. Not there. <laughs> How far away is it? Yeah, it's there. Now there's no adjustment for this of course. I'll drop it down a little bit. We'll sort of sneak a bit each way. Now I've been talking about a new scale. I'm not sure if I mentioned that the owner's gone and bought a new one from uh, Europe. Uh, this one was starting to fall apart and when I took it off most of the letters just sort of fell off. Alright, well that's the dial string done. That was pretty easy and uh, I've got the dial set up roughly. we just wait for the new dial plate to come along. Uh, I was just about to remount this speaker on its backboard and I started to wonder about this cloth. I was a bit apprehensive about putting it back. It's not in bad condition. I, I could probably wash it. Some of the stitching is coming apart. Uh, someone's put holes in it and it's also got glue on it. Now, none of that is going to affect it, and it's a new speaker, so it probably doesn't need the cloth. The cloth is there to stop the boominess down at the very low levels that you can get where it just tends to over-vibrate. Uh, Phillips thought this was a good way of fixing it. It may also act as a dust cloth. Uh, most people probably think it's a dust cloth. I believe it was actually an acoustic cloth. Here's a photo of a book I found on the internet that explains why they use these cloths. I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce it. Uh, I'll leave a link to the book in the description if you want to have a look. I think it's in Dutch. Uh, I used Google Translate and it translated out very well. So I think I'll make a new one. I'll keep the old one and if the owner wants the old one put back in, he's away at the moment. If he wants that put back in, we can fit that back in. If he likes the new one, we'll stick with the new one. So stick around and for something a little different, we'll do some sewing. G'day and welcome back to Dave's Sewing Circle. I'm going to have a look at making a new one of these covers. Now I've got the old cover there as a pattern. I've got some new material here, but I'm going to need some other sewing paraphernalia. I've nabbed my wife's sewing box. We'll have a look in there. 
there's some scissors, I can use them. Now I need some elastic. Uh, there's some there that'll do. Ah, there's a nice big piece, we'll use that. Alright, I'll we'll get rid of this stuff. I'll remove the old cloth. Uh, now it's got elastic in it. Um, so how am I going to spread that out? I can't. I've folded this in half. I was hoping to be able to just trace around it, but that's not going to work. Oh, that's as far as that goes. So that is, uh, let's see, it's six inches or 150 mil. Now I've got to allow for that little turned over bit and then double it. That's about 10 mil and then I need to turn a bit underneath as well. I guess you call that a hem, do you? Anyway, I've got to turn that underneath. So that's 10 and 5 and 150. That's 165 millimetre. Um, I've cut a square out. Of, this is about 350, I think. Uh, now I've got to work out how to cut a circle in material. I'm not quite sure, but I can do it the way I do it with paper if I'm doing that. I don't know if that's accurate enough. So I fold that into four. I'll put a mark here. One here. And I'm marking them at 165. And some in the middle. I should be able to just join the little dots with the little marks. So let's see how we went. That's not bad. It's not bad at all. I'll come back in a second with the next step. I've got my sewing machine set up. Uh, this is the My Little Pony model. It's just a miniature sewing machine for people who haven't got a lot of room and just do occasional sewing. I could have done without the flowers, but anyway, I'll learn to live with that. Now I've had a bit of a rethink on what I'm going to do here. Uh, initially I was just going to turn this over twice and sew it, but of course you're trying to get a bigger diameter into a smaller diameter. So I had a look on the internet, there's a couple of ideas I might try. Uh, one is to run a stitch around the edge, then fold it, stitch it again and then fold it again. So I'm going to try that. I've got enough material here, I've actually made this a bit bigger than it needs to be. I'm all set up, I've got the cloth in there, I've done a few stitches already. Uh, the idea is to run a straight stitch, I hope you're keeping up with this. The idea is to run a straight stitch all the way around here, about 6 mil in from the edge. So I'll see how we go. Uh, now I'm going to go and iron this and just iron it over where that stitch is. Alright, I'll iron that down. The next step is to put another stitch right next to the other one and then I've got to trim off the excess. So I'll snip this off. I hope the boys down the pub aren't watching this. Uh, now the next step is to cut this off close to that other stitch I just put in. Now, just to remind you, you are watching Dave's Radio Adventures. We haven't switched to Martha Stewart or something, although she's a cook, of course. All right, I'll just clean that little bit up there. Good. All right, I'm ready to do the last bit. I folded this over, and this is what you're supposed to do, but I think that stitch was supposed to pull it tight, and it hasn't done it. I probably used the wrong stitch. Anyway, I'm just going to persevere. We'll keep going. Uh, this will be the inside anyway, so it's not going to make a lot of difference. Just not going to be quite as nice as it should have been. I've done a little bit. I'm going to end up with little tucks in here. Um, anyway, that's okay. Okay, there we go. Oh, that was a disaster. Anyway. I think that'd win an award, you know. Not for quality, of course, uh, but some sort of award. It looks like a pizza dough. I'll just see how we went for size. I think it looks pretty good. That's not bad. That's not bad. That'll do. It's probably a little bit smaller than it should be, but that'll be alright. I'm going to try and get this elastic in here. I've got a bit of broken off knitting needle here. I'll see how that goes. So, if I feed that in there, this is going to be pretty big. I'm not sure it's going to fit. Now, my ambition was to get it on the Great British Sewing Bee. I think it's called that. I think I might shelve that idea. 
which reminds me, my sister-in-law did a knitting class years ago. Her class was called Knitwits. So when she finished it, she came home and proudly proclaimed she was a certified knitwit. I'm back. I'm there. Ah, cool. I pulled that elastic tight. We'll see how it goes. I'm not sure about using elastic. There's a bit of heat in there, so I don't know. Phillips seemed to have one in there. <laughs> okay. Well, I can't even open that. <laughs> All right. Uh, plan B. I have this about the right diameter, I think. The elastic isn't stretched. So I'll just tie it off, see what happens. I, I'm probably going to use a tie string in there because the, the elastic's just going to get affected by the heat. But I'll give it a go first and see if it's going to work. All right, there, there it is. I've, I've had to struggle a little bit. The elastic's useless. So I'll put a tie in there, maybe a bit of um, string or something. But um, that looks pretty good. Yeah, you can't complain about that. So I'll replace this with a string uh, and I'll come back when it's finished. All right, that's got the new string in it. I ended up using a bit of dial string. I need to get something a bit thicker than that. But it looks pretty good. Works all right. It's, um, not, it's not tight yet. It needs to come up further. But I had a bit of fun and a bit of a laugh. And if anyone's after a My Little Pony sewing machine. Uh, it's time to do the case. The case is in really good condition. It almost doesn't need anything doing to it. I'll give it a wash and I'll just clean it up with some Brasso. That's all it's going to need. Even the uh, white pin striping here, the highlight, that's in perfect condition. I'll just do that. I'll come back when it's all cleaned up. Uh, just before I clean it up, I did notice something in the back here. It has a bit of ply in here and the ply is lined with foil. So I'm assuming that's some sort of a barrier, an RF barrier. I don't think it'll affect the tuning of the radio, but we'll have to wait and see. Uh, the chassis bolts down here and sits against the foil here where you bolt it down. So I don't think it'll make any difference. Uh, there's the case. It's all polished up. It's come up pretty good. All they used was Brasso and polished it up with that. I also repainted the Phillips badge. Uh, the top had dulled off a lot, so I used a bit of Canaba wax with some brown stain in it, and that's brought the top up, so it looks good. Uh, the next thing I want to do is the speaker. It's not the original speaker. This is a, an Australian-made roller speaker. So someone's changed at some point. Unfortunately, that's what it is. What I want to do is work out which one of these terminals is negative and which one's positive. So I'm going to use a battery to find out. So I'll put a clip there and a clip on here. I have a one and a half volt uh, battery on the uh, black wire there. Now if I touch this, the speaker will move one way or another. Now it's coming out. So that would indicate that whatever the red wire is attached to is the positive terminal of the speaker. So there's the red wire, so this will be positive. I've attached some red and white wire here. So I'll solder those in. I've put the speaker in the cover. Um, I've put new cord in here too, so it's nice and thick cord I've got. So I'll tie that off. That'll do. Uh, now I've got to find where the mount holes go through here. I'll just put a podger through there. This is the speaker backboard. The screws have already got little points on them, so uh, Phillips had put pointy screws in so you could put the speaker in. So it should be just a matter of lining up my podger holes with the ones in here. Well, I've put those bolts on and I've put a little tag strip here. So what I intend doing is putting these wires down through the little holes there. I'll solder them on. Then you just need to attach the wires coming out of the radio to the top of the tag strip. Okay, I'm going to fit this back into the case. All right, the speaker goes in here like that. Uh, I think I'm in trouble here. I've got one clamp there. I've got another one that was sticky taped to the uh, case. 
So that'll go there, but I've got two more places with no clamps on them. I'll go out of my workshop, make up a couple of clamps similar to the original one here. This one here is an aftermarket one, somebody's put that on later. So I'll make up some sort of clamp, I'll come back and I'll put them on. I've made up a couple of brackets to put the speaker in, and I've also soldered the speaker wires onto that terminal strip that I put in there. I'll put the chassis back in the case. Uh, I've already fitted this knob, you have to get to the screw from the bottom, so I've already done that one up. I've repainted all the white rings on these, they come up pretty good. Now, I did have trouble with one of the knobs. One is slightly different to the other and it wouldn't polish up. So I was out in the garage trying to polish it up this morning and my wife called out from the door in the garage and said, what are you doing out there? You've been there for ages. And I said, I'm trying to polish my knob and I'm not having much luck. She said, oh, well, I'll leave you to it then, shall I? So she's wonderful, just really nice. It's all put back together and it looks really nice. A new dial's installed, the owner bought it around the other day. Uh, I think he got it from the Netherlands. I'll leave a link in the description, so if you need to uh, look him up, he does some other stuff as well as the dials. But that's an absolute perfect copy of the original. Absolutely spot on. This is the fabric that I had lying around, and I put it on. It looks okay, and it's kind of similar to what it had originally. Uh, it, had, of course, had the European style, where they have the uh, diamonds and things like that on the original. We don't have that. It's difficult to get here within a reasonable price. But I will look around for something else. Uh, it's also not tight, it's not taut. So for the minute, just pretend it's got a nice cloth on there. Here's the back of it. It's in its original condition. I did clean everything up, of course, but it's uh, original. There's no painting or anything going on. I'll turn it on. Here it is. Doesn't work. Mm, doesn't work. I've connected the aerial up, so we'll have a listen. There it is. And it doesn't work. I've connected it to the power, we'll try it out. Oh, it's just taking a while to warm up. Bloody hell. Well, as you saw there, I was trying to get this thing to work. It would not work, and I would turn it on, it would do nothing for a little while, and it would slowly come on, and you'd be able to get some stations, but as you went further up the dial, it didn't work at all. So I ended up pulling this apart again, and I put the um, oscilloscope on it, and I could see the oscillator wasn't working. And what I found was that the valve that I put the base on again, took the base off, glued it back on, and reconnected the uh, shield, it was intermittent. And I'd had this radio running for uh, two or three hours every night for a week, and it didn't, didn't fail at all, it never did anything. As soon as I put it in the case, this became independent. So um, I've put a, another valve in there. I don't have one of these with this base on it, but I do have one with an octal base. And here it is, it's an ECH33. The one that's supposed to be in here is an ECH3. Uh, this is the same valve, it's just got an octal base on it. So I made an adapter with an octal base to P base valve and we'll see if that works. So I'll try it again. I've just put it back in the case. Um, I had it tested on the bench, of course. While I had this out, I put a new um, fabric on the front. This is not a lot better, but it's better than the other one. It should be, there it is. ...therapy dogs so that they can go and share joy at vulnerable persons all across Australia, but also workers, first responders, uh, students in universities, people, uh, students in secondary So that's working now. Wholeheartedness that we've been talking about in Rilke, so that Deep for home. He put up 15 metres. Good water, Patty, giving chasing second spot from Sutton. Now, most of my radios won't pick that station up. I flicked it over to Longwave. Um, we didn't use Longwave in Australia, but uh, I can get some beacons, and I think these are nav beacons out in the, uh, the ocean near us. I'll turn it up. Uh, 
There's another one down here, just below 800. So there's another one there. So a bit of interference there, but that's about all I can get on long wave. I did pick up one of the airport um, information services once, but I haven't been able to get that again, so I'm not sure where that went. So I'll flick it back to medium wave. Anyway, we're back on medium wave. Pat the dogs and relax and breathe. Um, we will have university sessions, so therapy dogs. So it's working really well now again, and it had worked for ages <laughs> very well as well. So uh, that was a bit odd. No, I've never had that before where it worked until the minute I put it in the case. Well, that's about all I can do to this one at this stage. I've got to get a new valve, of course. I've got people chasing one for me. I might try and get a different fabric. This one's not fantastic. Uh, it's very similar to what was on there. Uh, so, you know, maybe I should leave it. As luck would have it, when I was talking, the doorbell rang. Uh, my wife got it and I got a delivery of some new fabric. So I've put that on so you can see what it looks like in the end. That looks much better than the, uh, the old sack that I had on there. But anyway, quite a few challenges on this one. Uh, a couple of my own doing, of course. And a couple of other interesting ones that cropped up, uh, not to mention the valve yesterday. So all in all, it's a bit of fun and it looks really good. It's fantastic to look at. So there it is. It's a Philips 206A. We believe it was built under German occupation of the uh, Philips factory uh, in about 1940, 41, 42, somewhere around there. So I hope you enjoyed this little adventure with me. Uh, I found it quite interesting. And if you did enjoy it, I hope you can join me next time in my next radio adventure. Music